You're listening to The Adventuring Party, talking about gaming the Irish way. Welcome to the party. I'm Dave. I'm Savage Mick. And I'm war- Warrior Lawyer uh, Scar, here to destroy <laughs> your legal arguments. I dispute this. Oh my goodness. It's going to be one of those episodes. Dave, why are we? Why are we? Okay, let's let's set the stage. Why are we sitting up at like half ten on a Saturday morning, the 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 fourteenth of January, twenty twenty three? Well, Elmick, that would be because uh, there's been a bit of a kerfluffle, a hoo ha, a uh, an incident, a uh, which party. is still ongoing. Uh, uh, has Hasbro um, Hasbro you know, were making some changes to the OGL? The open gaming license. Ah, the OTL. Something I honestly don't think I'd thought about in 15 <laughs> years. I love... That's just such a let's bury the lead opener. Yeah, oh yeah, there's a license that they're changing maybe. It's, it's nothing really. It's not a biggie. No one, the internet <laughs> isn't on fire. <laughs> it's only underpinning a good chunk of RPGs in existence. But that's one of the things that was so surprising me is just like... I didn't realize that there were so many RPGs that still used this thing. Loads and loads, and uh, not ju- not not for, not just fantasy ones or D and D retro clones. But uh, someone should probably explain what this that it's about. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, can I take a crack at it? Sure. O- sure. OGL Open Gaming License. Now, there's been a bunch of there's been some back and forth in terms of what OGL for what edition of Dungeons and Dragons, but it initially came about uh, with Third Ed as a way of um, providing third-party publishers uh, a means to use something called the system resource document or the open gaming content to make you know ancillary works to Dungeons and Dragons to make compatible ma- uh, material, even entire games that would either use the system or use um, elements of Dungeons and Dragons like the spells and monsters, things like that. Uh, to to provide you know an, another game to play or another supplement to add on to your your game three 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 point five era like what's you were releasing lots and lots and lots excuse me coffee's coming up lots and lots and <laughs> lots of supplements themselves but there was a huge appetite in the market and uh, what the OGL provided was a safe way of printing content that you know in theory at least is copyrighted material of Wizards of the Coast and D and D without having to worry about uh, entering into any sort of more sort of legally constraining license or being re- you know running the risk of being sued for using their content they were essentially granting a kind of a it wasn't a creative commons um, there are I mean there's guardrails on the original OGL which you can still go and find copies of but I'm not sure it's I don't know if it's actually hosted on uh, any Wizard of the Coast sites at the moment. I think but, it might be on the Open Gaming Foundation's website. Right, yeah. So, I mean, a whole structure sprang up around it. So the original the original intent is <laughs> is a, a molten beast because you can go and talk to the people who are responsible for crafting it. And they'll tell you something today that they might not have told you back then. Uh, but it, it, has been, it has been operated under by a great number of third-party publishers for the last 23 years who have built their own businesses. And as Shane, you're pointing out, some of them have div- diver- diverted so far from base D&D that you would wonder why they're still using the OGL. Uh, and one of the stipulations of the OGL is that it has to be reproduced in any content that you produce. So you have to put it in the back of the book or you know, yeah. put it on a separate page somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, so, okay. Sorry, Shane. No, go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I've uh, spent bit, way too much time looking at various gaming Discord servers the last week, and one comment I've seen crop up a fair bit is a number of creators who didn't actually feel they needed to enter the OGL um, added it because just as a way to, to signal that you know, this is going to be somewhat compatible with, you know, interchangeably with other games and as well as as a to join it you know basically to join in what they saw as a neat way of community building like yeah you know those sort of opinions weren't uncommon 
Hmm. Yeah, to to just like go back, we there obviously this is this uh, kerfuffle has made sort of a little bit heroes or maybe you know ambiguous anti heroes out of the original creators of the OGL. Um, comments from Ryan Dancy uh, himself, the architect of the whole thing. His motivation behind the thing was a to sort of leverage what we would call the network effect. The idea is that the more people who play D and D the more people play D&D, um, you know, you know, it becomes easier and easier the more material there is available for a game. So creating a license that that flooded the market with a whole bunch of cheap material for D&D was a, was a win for WotC in the, in the early days when they were getting off the second ed slump and trying to sell 3.0 as its own system, having a whole bunch of people just start producing adventure supplements nonsense for it while they were still sort of getting their feet, that was uh, that was to their advantage. But one of the other things was to sort of remove ambiguity um, of the whole licensing process. It's just like, if we make it so that the super clear... Um, Apparatus of the license for saying this part of my this part of my supplement it, this part of my part of my rules is uh, open uh, game content that anyone can use and this part of it is product identity that is my prop intellectual property then that means the entire process is super smooth and unambiguous and people are protected mm. and so they feel confident in. Um, uh, making their supplement and are not afraid of, you know, oh, Watsy's going to steal my stuff. Uh, so that was sort of the, the two-way thing, at least as Brian Dancy pushed it. Well, but, yeah, okay. there's, there's a very particular phrase in the original. Uh, it refers to uh, it refers to it, you know, the, uh, as a consideration for agreeing to this license. The And that's a that's a particular term of art in, in contracts, as I understand it. That a consideration is that both parties are benefiting here. This isn't just us being nice to you. This isn't just you getting something for free. There's an exchange of value, a consideration. And as part of that, we're going to place these stipulations and requirements on you. And we are also obliged to do things and abide by certain parts of this. Uh, we haven't seen a, a final version of whatever they intended to update the OGL to. I suspect considerations would have been taken out of it. Yeah, um, the, but the the second thing, and I think this is possibly where we're going back uh, back to all these people weren't expecting, like uh, the Fate RPG or Pathfinder Two Point which is a completely different beast from where it started. Um, they still had OGL uh, text in them, largely because the OGL was original OGL was constructed in such a way that it. It it gave legal free framework to a whole bunch of open gaming and flexible gaming uh, publishing in and of itself. So mm-hmm. even if you were barely adjacent to D and D at all, having OGL compatibility was seen as an advantage by a lot of writers. Be- just just because oh that gives me that sort of legal compatibility with everyone else. To, yeah, and, and to, that's, to emphasize yeah. the point. Like entire businesses have have been created and have grown up, as it turns out, pin uh, with this as an underpinning, like a key underpinning. Mm. You know, just just to emphasize that point. Yeah, and to uh, to sort of to to go a little further into that, the, um, why, as you say, Jade, why are they keeping it in the in their products? Because it's an open pipeline. It's saying to other people, if we've got this license in our product you can go and produce other works based on our work because the guys who run Paizo Pathfinder I mean they're probably delighted to see stuff on drive through RPG that is designed to work and be compatible with Pathfinder 2 because yeah. that's the point pa- like that, we can grow the ecosystem we can keep people coming in we can keep people buying stuff and if I see a bunch of Pathfinder 2 supplements available from third party publish them like oh that looks like a game that a lot of people are playing I want to play that and I'll try that. Mm. Uh, so it's it's yeah. It it grew an entire industry on its back, like uh, like yeah. barnacles on a turtle, uh, and it has been an absolutely rock solid foundation, or at least that's what everybody thought. That's how it was seen. That's how it was presented. It's, uh, so, it, but probably most importantly, and again, we're not legal people. It's how an entire industry has behaved, 
And the architects of that license, the holders of that license, haven't said otherwise for 20-something years. So that's where we find ourselves today. Then we get to January. Well, apparently this first started coalescing in in the middle of December. I I was Mm. busy, you know, finishing up work, heading home to see the family at the time. But, yeah, we started hearing, like, whispers of this during December, but it was really early January. Was it the 5th? I believe. Uh, January 4th, 5th. Uh, four, 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 fourth going into the 5th. Like. Well, the I, first day back of the year, and all of a sudden this this drops in your... A lot of people have not had a fun January, I can tell. <laughs> it's been exciting. Dave, wh- when did the first ripples appear in the, on the shores? Um, yeah, so... Uh, yeah, like, wh- while N-World, N-World describes... Um, the matter breaking on roll for combat on January the fourth. Uh, there were earlier rumblings from you know the excuse me. Um, one one uh, in, indestructo boy uh, back in De- back in December uh, blew the whistle on 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 the OGL one point one leak. And yeah, the thing is, this was a leak. This wasn't uh, you know. The, the, this wasn't um, you know put out for testing or you know feedback this was uh, you know this, this the only reason this was released be- ahead of time was true leaks and I mean to date it hasn't been officially released but yes uh, so we yeah we again we're folks this entire we've talked about this before we went uh, to record and we're aware that if you're listening to this, you're probably well aware of a lot of things that have gone on. You've seen a lot of opinions. And we're aware that, yes, we are probably just adding to the churn around this topic. So we've discussed how we might minimize that. Uh, We're not legal people. Uh, We're not industry insiders. We've recorded enough shows, we probably should be at this point. (laughs) But we're not. We're sitting about as as far out in the periphery as you are, uh, attempting to discern what's going on, the, the white heart the white hot heart of this matter but we can speak to we can you know we can comment on what people have done that is out in the open public uh, and what a lot of people have done based on the leaks provided by indestructible boy and then roll for combat and later uh, linda codega who was probably the first major mainstream media if you like uh, outlet a uh, reporter to break this uh, what we can say is that a lot of people have come forward to confirm or shore up those claims. So we haven't seen an official version of the 1.1 that was purported to have been put around. But uh, as you're saying, Dave, it wasn't uh, it wasn't fired out as a test case. Uh, this was being put in front of people with a, a pen and a sign here sort of attitude. Hmm. All right. So where do we go next? Uh, I guess we could discuss the general changes oh, back, back, of the sorry, back to Dave what, what happened after the 5th oh, after the 5th um, well uh, io9 slash gizmodo um, you know got leaked well got got a hold of a leak that got published on the 5th and the over the course of the next few days there was some very interesting comments such as from a uh, one of the higher ups in Kickstarter, uh, who 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 talked about uh, a con, you know, like a, a deal worked out with uh, Watsi, um, you know, that instead of twenty five percent of all like of, of of all sales got you know from a creator using the OGL, that you know if you funded your project through Kickstarter, that you know you would only have to pay twenty percent. And Kickstarter touching none of that, you know, and basically, you know, basically as an incentive to do your crowdfunding, your D, your OGL related crowdfunding through Kickstarter. And not, absolutely nothing he said or, or alluded to contradicted previous uh, our future leaks. 
Yeah. <laughs> right. It's just okay. like, this is the best we can do. We can take 5% off this ludicrous overhead. Not to make Kickstarter's yeah. taking its that, fee as well. That, so. That's not 25% of profits, by the way. That's 25% yeah. of sales. Yeah, After, that was the... Uh, yeah. I, I'd like, yeah, John I'd like Ritter is the, yeah. the guy. We'll come back uh, to that one. Uh, there's, a, there's an awful lot to dig into there. If, you can, if you've got no other firm ground to stand on, you can point to that and go, oh, hell no. Uh, right, so... We've got the we've got the leaks. We've got uh, it goes mainstream. Uh, Linda Cadega has covered this extensively now on uh, on the publication they work for, uh, io9 slash Gizmodo, and is active on Twitter as soliciting uh, opinions and and further leaks, etc. Well worth following them to see where the story is going in the next few days. Uh, wh- where does that bring us to? That brings us to the long silence. That, yeah, that we endured after, from Watsi. After the first leak, there was basically nothing from Watsi for an entire week of the internet going crazy, and just In- a just like uh, uh, just a churn of, of 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 nonsense. People being right, people being wrong, people being ro- right and wrong on the internet simultaneously, and Watsi dead silence. And this is so the originally it was just Twitter outcry, Twitter outcry, uh, all over the place. People complaining. Uh, then that's when the um, that's when the calls for action started happening because well there was nothing else to do, so people decided well I'll seize the initiative, and this is when people start saying stuff like. Um, well, I guess I'll have to drop the OGL now, or oh, I guess I'll have to drop fifth edition as as a product I support now, or yeah. I guess I'll have to pull my entire product line and rebrand it with my own system. I'll have to come up with now. Ooh, yeah, stay and, tuned. and these weren't you know, and like, and these weren't just you know any old people. These were the likes of uh, Cobalt Press, who, who, as far as I know, have been only making you know fifth edition third party supplements for the last few years, and they, some of the better ones. Yeah, they're they're <clears throat> veterans of five A. They've been making their stuff for Midgard ca- campaign setting the entire time, printing people from all kinds of people, uh, veterans and new. And they, they're, they're some of the contractors that Watsi pulls in when they can't be bothered to uh, finish their own adventures. Yep. Um, and they're, um, they're creating an, an entirely new system, uh, you know, Operation Black Flag. It's, uh, it's <laughs> under, under a code name at the moment. Yeah, there's been an awful lot of pirate memes going around lately. And I wonder why. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, but um, you you have other like a few days after that you had Paizo, a you know a little known <laughs> RPG company, uh, talking about creating their own um their their own open open license uh, uh you know with the acronym ORC, um, um and yeah. put, and here's an interesting bit um they're t- like what they want to do is put it into a foundation so that even if Paizo gets knocked out of business or taken over by somebody who doesn't care about open gaming that orc will continue under said foundation as it would be a separate entity yeah like i do believe that like in theory there's an open gaming foundation for the ogl but it's but what's he retained all the actual legalese of the licensing so while the, the ogf might have supported ogl um activity they they, they have no ability to stop what's he from um, from going crazy as they did, whereas apparently the whatever Orc Foundation that uh, Paizo is putting together, uh, in theory, would be able to go. Uh, no, that's not what the ORC is for. Um, I, I was just like, like the, the, the one of the big greatest things about this is that like the the leaked one point one document very specifically called out Watsy should not be feeding its competitors. And what have they done? They've once again, not just oh. they've feed the competitors, they fed, fed the same competitor that they <laughs> fed when they made 4th edition and created Pathfinder. Like, All right, hold on. Paizo I don't have experience that, at this. Let's, let's, just, let's that stick to the timeline. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's stick to this. Oh, sorry, this gets us to 
Yeah, so we got the silence. We've got the uh, the noise and memory that fills that silence for about a week. I think we get to was it Wednesday when uh, Thursday? I think Wednesday, was Thursday. Like, when, Wednesday. This is the eleventh uh, or twelfth when there's yeah. a, meant to be a, a live stream to address these concerns. Ah, uh, yes, that's the third reportedly. And uh, yeah, I supposedly. Um, the live stream went ahead for about a minute or two, oh, wow. and yeah. the comments were blowing up, and then the, it just got caught. Did not know that. Um, uh, I, yeah, I, no, no, I, I, saw, I saw what purported to be a screenshot of the um, of, of comments, um, and there was a lot of uh, open D and D tags hashtags. But, yeah, uh, so we finally do get a response uh, on Friday the thirteenth. <laughs> Of all days, we mm. finally get uh, an update to the open game license pr- uh, published on D&D Beyond. Um, and uh, yeah, let's just let's just stop there for a second and, and say uh, it is a response to something that you know, there's been a lot of rumor and speculation about, and uh, we've never seen this 1.1, and promises us that there is a an OGL coming uh, again. Presumably that'll get leaked next week. So you know, in, in an effort to to build up uh, feedback, let's just talk about the response, the response, the response. <laughs> Honestly, the, the the third degree response has been relatively. Eh, it's too late now. Like as soon as as soon as people start jumping ship, like the the problem is not the the well. Okay, the problem is the original text of the license, but. The real problem is no one trusts anything Watsi's going to put out now. They could put out something where they they give D&D to you if you sign the, the OGL, and I don't think anyone's going to take it at this point because they don't know, they no longer trust that um that Watsi's not going to try something like this at some point in the future. And like, uh, and particularly because the the terms of the of the 1.1 leak were so odorous that and, and you know that you know like you could tr- you, know, you you can't trust them and you've got you've got an indication of how badly they would exploit that trust if you did give it to them yeah yeah so there's been a lot of resp- there's been a lot of white hot takes on the uh, the update blog post uh, Dave that brings us to this morning when you dropped another little nugget in our laps right before we uh, we sat down to record. Yeah, um, it appear it appears that um, that the publicly released the publicly released text has been um, has been fiddled with by 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 someone, presumably Watsi employees. Um, you know, like as in uh, the, the 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 particular tweet uh, describes it as appearing to be editing this in real time. Um, uh, compare, comparing screenshots uh, take at different times of their live page, and I believe you confirmed that with the Wayback Machine, uh, Mick. There's a lot of there's a lot of um, snapshots taken of it, uh, and there's lots of people posting images on Twitter uh, showing where passages have been altered, sentences deleted, uh, and it would appear at the moment I compared the texts before we went live with what was posted uh, yesterday at about 4 p.m. their time. Uh, and what's currently live now, and the texts are identical. So, but the, the, but there's been a lot of talk on, on in the usual uh, places about how the text has been changing, and people are apparently able to show up at receipts. Bear in mind, um, you can do almost anything with uh, screen grabs and uh, HTML pages if you want to. Like I could, I could take this text now and insert a long passage about uh, how. Um, how Gary Gygax was right all along, uh, and it would appear legit, just no one else would ever see it. So we've got, but Wayback Machine is generally regarded as a pretty good uh, mm-hmm. archivist. Uh, if people want to go and, I mean, there's been a lot of revisions to the page, a lot of snapshots taken of the page, which would indicate the page is changing or has been changing. I haven't gone through every single one of them to see what's changed when, but it's definitely a, this is a, a living document, if you will. Yeah, and that just sort of speaks to the the weirdness of the what's your response at all. First, like like first there was the massive silence, and then there were, that now we're getting this, uh, you know, oh, 
we see your concerns and we see this big argument and we just feel that both of us have won. And it's an amazing the, line. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's the, amazing. D, the D&D Beyond um, blog post, uh, none of which is binding, by the way. It's a blog post. Course, it's not a yeah. contract, of course. Um, <laughs> but it starts off... <sighs> It's 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 like the entire. Actually, it it starts off and continues with basically trying to play down, first of all, the numbers of critics, as in tr- implying that it's a few loud voices that are giving out for some reason, maybe because they're bad people. Uh, again, implication. Um, a lot of waffle, uh, a lot, a lot, quite a dollop of condescension, and. Just generally not ad- really addressing the the most the, the most horrible you know um, realities of 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 the of the OGL one point one again assuming those leaks are accurate, um, uh, so, like they don't make any reference to the sheer amount uh, of revenue that uh, the that that the that the purported OGL was going to look for. Um, they don't make any reference to, the de- to deals cut with the likes of Kickstarter, and generally, it's um, it's a, it seems to be an attempt to whitewash and play down. Okay, and it's still being so... edited as go because, like, the Watsi's lack of response. This it really does seem like, like they were absolutely, completely blindsided by this and. Like I can't describe their behavior as anything other than scrambling. Like they have, Fair. they have, they basically some the leak went out, people started picking up on it, and someone probably not even at Watsi but at Hasbro Legal told everyone at Watsi to shut up for a week, and that just made everything worse. Oh, we well, forgot. In the we forgot of a bit. You're <clears throat> going to have speculation and hot takes. We did forget a bit. There was a an email that purported to come from a Watsi employee that was uh, released to I think it was Linda Kodega and a few others, um, that basically said, "Look, you, the, it's Watsi management are silent because they're scrambling. Uh, they have complete contempt for the players. They don't understand you know, why they can't do what they like. Uh, they view the." Their customers as an obstacle to their money. Uh, can anyone? I think I, I'd have to go and find that, that. Those are the main points. Like, yeah. <sighs> so that, I... that was another thing that was purported to be again, no attribution, but people saying like, "This is what we're, uh, this is what we're seeing. This is what's being sent to us." Um, and then, yeah, we've the we've the update now. Let's okay, folks. If you're listening, if you're still listening, uh, go put the kettle on. This is going to be a long one. Let's step back now. Shane, you've been keeping track of kind of who are the stakeholders, who are the winners and losers uh, as this okay. thing has progressed. Let Just take well, us through what you've got there on your, okay. on your let's say, murder board. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, like, obviously, the main stakeholder is Watsi and, through extension, uh, Hasbro. Now, if you're a child of the 90s by me, you know Hasbro um, as a toy manufacturer. Uh, they make G.I. Joe's, they make what's their... Do they own Barbie? I Monopoly. Know. They make Monopoly. Monopoly. Oh, Barbie. Oof. You name it. Yeah, they, they, a lot they, of board games. Yeah, they make a lot of board games, a lot of things, and they have basically, over the last 20 years, turned Watsy into their specialist geek gaming arm, and that's been a big part of that's been a growing part of the business, but people don't realize exactly how big until COVID hit, when they realized that with physical toy sales on the outs uh, and a huge amount of intellectual their intellectual property they've bought over their their uh, years transferred into Watsi to sort of section it off to the experts, quote unquote. Um, at some point in around twenty twenty, people noticed that was Watsi was making up about 50%? Well, okay, sorry, I think 2020 was about 30%, and it's grown to about 50% over the, over the COVID period. But, like, yeah, something like uh, 50% of uh, Hasbro's revenue is now coming... Is it the revenue or revaluation? I can never remember. It's. I wouldn't. Uh, I'm not sure. I could put an exact sort of percentage, or you'd have to see the books. You can a quick search will tell you that in 
um, that in 2021, Hasbro's revenue was reported at about 6.4 billion. And in the same year, uh, Watsi's reported revenue is 1.3 billion. So they're a very significant part of the Hasbro group. They're, and the, that's been elevated, as you say, during COVID because people stayed home, people played games, people, a lot of, uh, the Watsi, of course, released Magic as well. Magic, huge money earner for the company. Um, a massive driver of profit. So, yes, uh, whatever percentage it is, whatever way you cut it out, uh, you're looking at a big chunk of an already big company. Yeah. And this has sort of gone into a sort of cycle of them putting more and more uh, emphasis on Watsi. I believe the cutoff point, uh, this is research done by a fellow podcast member, Owen, uh, is that by 2016, a guy called Chris Cook uh, took the head of Watsi stations. He's the guy who sort of revamped magic and has sort of presided over the building of 5th edition D&D from merely a game into a, a, a lifestyle brand. And I believe the inflection point was 2021, where the previous head of Hasbro, the previous CEO of Hasbro died, and uh, this Chris Cook guy uh, moved from Watsi uh, to the head of the entire Hasbro division and brought in a bunch of ex-Microsoft people. Uh, names escape me at the moment, but uh, yeah, ex-Microsoft software people to sort of take over Watsi and continue the process of commodit- commoditizing um, uh, the, the the brands there into, you know, money-making machines. Yeah, the, the most prominent in- name is Cynthia Williams, who came in as CEO. Uh, she's a former Microsoft, Xbox, and Amazon, I think it's Fulfillment, uh, executive. So she's, I mean, she's worked for big companies, and she worked extensively with Microsoft for over about three or four years during a period where microtransactions and recurrent sales and things of like that really took off. Again, pandemic stuff. Mm, yeah. So that's that's the main stakeholder here. Uh, then there's the laundry list of people who are still on the OGL for various reasons. Uh, obviously, there's all the people making 5th ed third-party content, so your Matt Covels, your Cobalt Presses, your... Um, Lots of people. Darn Not the DMs yeah. Guild people, because the DMs Guild has a completely different licensing structure, so this isn't going to affect the DMs Guild directly, but, you know, it does sort of put crosshairs on the DMs Guild because it's very clear that WotC will... It, it, we'll get back to that. Um, uh, the other big one is, of course, Pathfinder, which, despite having completely re- revamped its rules... Um, in second edition a few years ago, still uses the OGL because it's it's sort of bringing that legacy of uh, where Pathfinder came from, as in a spin-off from the original 3.5. Um, but then there's uh, indie games actually using that. The, the big one that was crazy to me was uh, the, fa- the game Fate. Um, uh, one of the big poster childs of uh, of the uh, story game, uh, you know, narrative-based RPG movement, um, I thought, I thought for sure that yeah, they have a system reference document, the same way that three point five and five fifth ed do, but I assumed that their system system reference document had its own legal framework behind it. But no, apparently they were just using the OGL and the mechanisms of the OGL to push their SRD uh, around. And so they were reliant on this same infrastructure of legalese that had been put together in 2000 by uh, the old Watsi. Uh, and apparently a lot of OSR people were also using OGL because they... You know, they're not using the system reference documents, they're using old additional rules as their basis, but they're still working with enough D&D adjacent terminology and stuff that they felt it's probably better to have 
OGL legal structures to work with, uh, then because the OSR is all about all this intermingling, people felt it was good to sort of, you know, steal each other's ideas and create their own RPGs based on that. So, yeah, and o- OGL offers a framework for that. Um, now, originally there were some people worried that um, they might... Um, the the this the OGL might cover stuff like um, the Knights of the Old Republic games because those used a version of the uh, Star Wars RPG which was self was based on the three point oh rules. Um, according to Ryan Dancy, uh, Lucas Arts had a its own special deal where they were essentially. LucasArts retained the rights to the, the mechanics of uh, the Star Wars RPG and thus uh, the mechanics in KOTOR. So that's not actually a problem, but that was something that was being talked about a lot. Um, but yeah, Ooh, a, another pin in that because, you know, that I think could come back on, on, on the wise. Um, I think those are the main ones. Uh, I have a whole section here about the legalism involved, if we care about that, but I think we're past that point now that the ORC is out and there's talk of rollbacks and what's going to happen to OGL 2.0. To be clear as well, um, a lot of different companies have announced they're making their own games, um, and a a bunch of companies, large and small, have announced that they're going to be releasing their own licenses. And there's some overlap between those, obviously, but uh, yeah, so it's not just like Orc is not going to be the only player in the game, at, uh, but but the, what Hasbro has managed to do and is, well, incentivize people to not rely on the OGL at all and to get away from it as soon as they as soon as they reasonably can. Okay, uh, so let's just uh, to keep things kind of on a, a sort of a linear path. Um, we've so we've we've addressed the timeline. We've looked at the stakeholders now. So let's step back then to the document that really kicks all of this off, uh, which is the OGL 1.1. That uh, anybody can go and see now. <laughs> it's it's all over the place. Uh, you can the, probably the easiest human relatable URL I can find is ogl.battlezoo.com. Battlezoo belonging to the Roll for Combat folks, who um, I believe are major Pathfinder people. Uh, so they've, they've got a vested interest in making sure everyone sees this uh, in all of its ugliness. Uh, the 1.1 document that was leaked, um, and that so far, you know, no one seems to have refuted the contents of, is quite a piece of work. Uh, as it, <laughs> it purports to be a direct descendant from 1.0a, which is about 900 words long, and is quite readable. It's about two pages, which is why it's so easy. In fact, you can get it down to one page, which is why it's so easy to include. Uh, yeah, it's a page at the back of the book, like, or at exactly. the front. If you own almost anything printed in the last 20 years that is even slightly related to uh, Dungeons & Dragons, if you go and have a flick through it, you can probably find a copy of the OGL 1.0a to look at and read yourself. The new, uh, what was purported to, this was going to be the success of 1.1, is a very different beast. 9,000 words uh, over about 15 pages with commentary. Lots of commentary. Uh, lots of lots of cute commentary and lots of repetition, which is why it's so long. Uh, I, again, not a legal person of any standing whatsoever. But does it, uh, you're going to have to read it yourselves, folks. There's a lot. We could, we could spend the next hour simply going over this document. What, what would our broad strokes... Uh, it breaks it down into a commercial non- and non-commercial fan uh, license, which is a, a it splits in half, and it's pretty much the same stuff. Uh, what are the uh, what are the takes? That, what can we take away from it? What do you guys One, think of it? Uh, well, the third. Well, there's a little. Uh, one of the rubs is uh, they, you know. They can, you know, Hasbro, ca- you know, can revoke the license from from its users uh, with thirty days' notice, which is nothing in business terms. Um, so, particularly in the environment where you know pr- printing delays can easily take like six months, uh, given the 
the, the way books and printing and stuff is happening these days. Yeah, it's so that, like as, as as I was referring to before, um, the OGL 1.0 was at the base and en- it ended up at the basis of a lot of businesses and got added to a lot of products. Not that it didn't necessarily need to be, but was for various reasons was it was an accepted, widely understood standard, and um, yeah, this 1.1 basically puts a bomb to that, and you. Know, uh, makes it an incredibly unreliable underpinning for well even a personal project let alone a business yeah it's just like it's it's not so much that the new text is weaker uh it's that it's explicitly this can be changed at any at any time we feel like we want to and uh, there's nothing you can do about it it's actually the the real killer for me is the amount of language that is like you can't do anything about this by citing this, you give up your rights to complain about it at all. Um, and Yeah, there's a section, miscellaneous section, which is like, uh, you won't engage in class action, you'll agree by uh, review by counsel, uh, you waive, waive jury trial rights, like all this stuff. Now, as many, many legal opinionists, both professional and otherwise, have pointed out, you can put anything in a contract and you can sign it doesn't mean it's legal not necessarily you can, I mean, there's there's certain i mean there might be some rights you can sign away but there's certain rights you can't and in any jurisdiction which a contract is contested there are probably statutes which will override any of the more onerous conditions you might find in a contract um if you go to a car park and you see a, a a sign on the wall that says you you know you're responsible there's no responsibility management for theft or, or breaks or damage or whatever that's a sign someone can put up it doesn't mean it's true and it's and the same applies companies can put all sorts of things in contracts and you might sign them it doesn't necessarily mean that they'll all stand up but you better be ready to to feed the lawyers uh, if you want to contest them but yes the 1.1 that we've seen has a, a load of language that is you know, what's mine is mine, and what's yours is mine. Uh, yeah. Uh, there was also, like, I think, I honestly feel like the part about, you know, how much revenue uh, you owe, uh, Watsi, it's just like, if you owe, if you earn more than uh, three quarters of a million gross in some ways, uh, then from then on, you're, you owe 25% to Watsi. Like, that's onerous, pretty onerous especially since it's gross and not profit so like it's it's just going to cripple the overhead of a whole bunch of uh, uh of uh medium to large businesses and in a really bad way so we had that but like we'll get back to that i don't think the point of that is to make money the real weird one for me is like if you earn more than fifty thousand dollars you have to annou- announce to watsy that you have done so and like, are are they like who are they expecting to handle this? Are they expecting like just every day, um, people at Watsi overworked, understaffed, are supposed to just open their mailbox and have a dozen letters coming out? Are, are they planning to have an Excel sheet somewhere? I I I I just can't imagine like the the average grunt at Watsi is is the person you want to have organizing all your legalese about. The dozens of people trying to make products every day. I that particular that particular point is unclear. Uh, it's in the document on page ten. There's language around reporting revenue, but when it comes to what you need to do, there's just brackets that says method for reporting income. Um, perhaps that would have to be. They didn't have, didn't appear to have anything set up for that. So there are people who are, are arguing that this is a draft document it's a test run document and surely it would be you know it wouldn't be like this when it went out look it's, it's even finished uh, and that might give some credence to that but I think I made a point online last night uh, on the discord join our discord uh, see I got in somewhere um, if you want to write a legal document you don't sit down and write the contents of a birthday card or a cake recipe or something else first you write the document pretty close to what you intend it to be you don't start from a mile off and say, well, I'll get there eventually by changing things. You start relatively close to where you intend to land. 
Uh, and even if all the T's aren't crossed and the I's aren't dotted in this document, it would appear that 1.1 was pretty close to where wizards intended to land. And the language around content sharing, what's pr- permitted, and we sh- and the, a very explicit uh, carving out saying this is only 1.1 is only for printed and PDF uh, works. So it can, books, if you like, books, supplements, uh, things like that. And it very explicitly says that you can't use this to license things like virtual tabletops or uh, some cute nonsense about it It can't be used for virtual tabletops, uh, pageants, pantomimes. So mm. cosplay and live streams. Cosplay, yeah. Pantomime. Uh, Did did that 5e uh, RPG, was it Celasta Crown of the Manager, did that make any money that they they feel that's a threat? Uh, I don't. That's still an early access. It's available on Steam, etc. In fact, it's an early access. Han has a bunch of uh, DLC, so we can talk about that some other time. Uh, the, the Kingmaker series, the Pathfinder computer games, certainly impressed people, and a lot of money has been spent on them. And none of that will be flowing to uh, to Watsy's coffers. So it's very clear well, that in the in the the new gaming space where D and D is everywhere all the time. That what he looked around and went, that's a lot of money that we feel like that should be ours, and here's the legal document we're going to use to get it. Yeah, uh, here's here's the um, sort of where I start Sherlock Holmes out, or sort of Columboing out a motivation for all of this, um, because this sort of thing is like, like though oh, this hypothetical OGL, this one point one, like it's not intended to be a blocker to all contracts i f- like i feel like a, one of the big things about it is that it's meant to cut off open content from specific venues and i think the emphasis on you can't use this on video games or vtts is telling because uh, if you can't use the ogl then you have to go to watsi and make a deal it's not cutting off other types of contracts but it is disincentivizing uh, you from just uh, it's OGL open game license. Go ahead, print it. It's it it it's sort of trying to incentivize the uh, come to the table and we will work out something. It it's 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 less designed, I think, to um to you know facilitate uh, printing as as sort of to make sure that the that you know there's a Hasbro lawyer, you know, with holding the pen for you uh, as you as you make any deals with Watsi directly about whatever product it is that you want to make. We'll, uh, we'll have a speculation section at the end of this, but I think maybe we'll close off our discussion of 1.1 because it's there for people to read. It's boring. It's all. Yeah, it's, it's out uh, at this stage. It's, it's out, and whether it is the final version or a draft or anything else, you have to, a reasonable person I think would have to assume that it is pretty close to what what's he intended going forward um, and we'll we'll stop there on that so that takes us to what I will always think of as the hot wet week in January when everybody else decided that in you know in the absence of statements from what's he, they were going to do their own damn thing let's talk about orcs <laughs> yes so Paizo has decided uh, we have to tell you we have to teach you this lesson again old man and have <laughs> <laughs> charged in with um, a new open gaming license alternative, the open role playing creation license or ORC. Um, you can uh, go onto their own website to look at it because when it they it announced it down again, has a stop. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, when they announced it, uh, I think two days ago, um, the their their own website fell over, um, no, uh, you know, from the sheer amount of interest, which um, probably is promising for them. <laughs> Let me tell you, this probably. was not a good week to try and buy uh, Pathfinder Two uh, core books off of Paizo, <laughs> but next week it'll probably yeah. be fine. Okay, orcs, where are we? Okay, so yes, they have signed up. I believe um, Cobalt Press. We said uh, Green Ronin. So these are this the, the that's you know the 
well, the, the veteran. These Green Order are the people who, like, I think day one, Gen Con 2000, uh, third edition's just been released. Green Ronin, I'm pretty sure, were one of the people who had a adventure ready to go um, on day one. Or if if not them, then like like they were a couple months after. Green Ronin have been in the OGL space the entire time, so that's a hard swerve into the RC uh, from them right there. Uh, say Cassium, um, you name think- it. You name it. If it's a big boy, there are rumors that uh, uh, Pinnacle Entertainment Group, Peg Inc., was going to. Um, I don't think I confirmed that, but I did see uh, Atlas Games. I think yeah. they signed up. They're they're coming to the other fast. Yeah. So this list will change and expand. You know, even as we're saying this, like I imagine. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So uh, MCDM have sort of said they're going their own way. Uh, that's Matt Colville's crowd, who's also yeah. probably talking extensively on the subject as we speak. Uh, but there's definitely a. Uh, I, I mean, I've I've drawn the comparison to the scattering from the Dune series when when you if you just keep compressing a civilization and keep sort of forcing it down and, and keep you know standing on its neck, eventually. You reach critical mass, and everything just goes flying off in different directions. And that's—I think that's my prediction has been borne out. Uh, that's how this—that's how this goes. Uh, yeah, there, predictably, there, all the major players. F- went, yeah, sorry. There's been a flight uh, over the last week. Like people have made big commitments to just getting away from anything Watsi does. Um, all of the sentiments, you know, all the great OSR. Uh, you know, nostalgic sentiments. Oh, D D is shouldn't be a brand. It should be a lifestyle that we all do. A folk tradition. Um, those are suddenly getting a lot more traction as people are, are, are embracing the open D and idea. Hashtag open D and D has been a uh, trending on Twitter. Uh, I'm not sure. Well, they have a how much as is well. that oxygen or uh, pies are going to suck up but I, I suspect there's going to be an awful lot of um, attempts to create uh, open s- uh, systems of, of various levels um, there's also been like the sort of uh, has it like swing pendulum of legal action uh, Paizo have said that they have not ruled it. they said I, th- I think they said that they would take legal action to Watsi if they print the 1.1 as it was. What that means at this point when there's theoretically work on a 2.0 <laughs> is unclear, but Paizo did say that uh, they would at the very least heavily consider uh, legal action. Um, we've gotten a few uh, anecdotes about this. Uh, we're hearing numbers like, like if you wanted to take this to court, the legal fees would be somewhere between one and three million, and I, you- I, yeah, there's even there's there's even some higher figures than that. Like, mm-hmm. but yeah, those those seem to be the range that keeps cropping up. Yeah, so oh. some in the region of uh, one to three million, and your odds aren't great. I heard like fifty fifty shot is about what you'd expect. Uh, you're winning, and if you lose, you would then have to take on. Uh, presumably, some of Watsi's legal fees, which that that would be pretty much a double yeah. kick in the nuts. To, it's uh, all, it's all going to depend on where that action is fought, uh, under oh, what jurisdiction, yes, and, and what particular sort of uh, legal uh, argument is being made. But yes, uh, yeah. Matt Colville sort of said he sat down with his lawyers, and they were like one to two million, fifty fifty shot, take your chances. Uh, Open D and D, as it stands now, it has sixty six thousand. Uh, signers of its open letter to Watsi, uh, and yeah, we're seeing a, a constellation of new announcements, agreements, legal frameworks being sort of set up or purported to be set up, uh, and people signing on all over the place. Um, that's the so that's the scattering that's kind of happened last week. Uh, what do we think then? Okay, look, let's jump to yesterday, or hit about to hit the hour mark. Let's jump to yesterday and look at Watsi's first kind of breaking cover on this with their official statement. Uh, I have it here. We could, it's 
not terribly long. We could read the whole thing, but uh, probably anyone who's listening to this at this point has probably read it already. Uh, it is, as someone pointed out earlier, one of probably one of the most condescending <laughs> oh, climb downs I've I mean, ever seen. The word gaslighting isn't isn't a stretch here. It's like as it you know it, it's very much like yo know, we're sorry that you have a problem vibe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's always a great sign. Right. I mean, um, some, let's let's pick some bits out of it. Um, they in the first paragraph they double down on this idea that a new license agreement is to protect us from oh the blockchain and NFTs. Like maybe if you you could possibly have made that argument in September of last year, in the dying days of the of the NFT bubble, but nobody's buying that today. Nobody's nobody's taking a chunk out of a one point three billion dollar company with ugly monkey pictures like that's just not happening uh so that on a face but it's just nonsense um let's rewrite that we don't like digital competition because we've got our own uh, vtt coming and we're damned if we'll share uh any more market uh share with uh with competitors especially as we've been trying for nearly a decade now to make this happen and we keep failing while people like roll 20 and foundry and many many others lead the way in this space uh, if we can't if we can't compete with them let's just cut them off the knees interesting yeah that, that's that it's not great that way yeah so that's so they go on uh, they said that's why our early drafts of the new OGL included the provisions they did so they're this is I think significant enough it says look there are early drafts out there yes they were leaked and yes they're accurate for the, you know at the time they were leaked we did put that language in there we did put like they're basically saying like we've we we wrote that document and we you know stand over it to some extent we had in, we had you know intended it to it to fly uh, in its in that form or in a form very close to it uh, that's uh, I think that says a lot the draft language is provided to content creators and publishers so their feedback could be considered before anything was finalized okay maybe um, I. The, a lot of that probably went out under NDAs. Uh, I can only imagine what any company uh, asked for feedback on handing over 25% of its revenue would have had to say. Uh, probably very short and expletive laden. Uh, yeah, again, not profits, re- entire revenue. I, in, in an industry I, I, where margins aren't fantastic. Yeah, I wanna, I, I've got a whole thing I'd like to say about that, but I, I'm, I'm holding fire just for the moment. There's a lovely All line right. in here. However, it's clear from the reaction that we rolled a one. Oh, shucks. They, they made a gaming reference. It has become clear that it's no longer possible to fully achieve our goals, all three goals, while still staying true to our principles. Now, I love this line. Actually, I absolutely love this line. Can anyone... I'm not a rules guy, as I'm sure anyone listening to the podcast knows. Can anyone remind me... Um, when is... you know when is, I think that used to say uh, we rolled a critical failure, we rolled a one... When do you? When does a one count as a critical failure? Uh, attacks generally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <sighs> I think they modified that line. I'm pretty sure that makes I, it a critical. My failure favorite one is the fact that the the art they used for the thing, which is, is now gone. For, yeah. It's for a counter spell. <laughs> Uh, that's the the flavor text, which is the path is closed to you, and the the card itself. It's a what's it's a Magic the Gathering card. Is uh, bolt the gate something like that? Oh, bar the gate. Bar yes. the gate. I, now, I when do you, s- when do you bar the gate? Um, when people we have to escape. After well, the, in the horse middle is of bolted. a conflict, I would imagine, <laughs> yeah, or just or, before it, or, or after the horse is already bolted. I some very <laughs> cle- some very clever peon somewhere. Inside uh, the uh, the D and D Beyond machine shows that artwork. I guarantee nobody, nobody in corporate <laughs> shows that artwork, and it's gone now, which is is telling because it was immediately mm. flagged as, "Hey, this is kind of funny." I'd, I'd say somebody else might be gone too. Uh, <laughs> like the 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 signal flags from inside the building now are starting to. Man, I made a comment last night on on the Discord. Go join our Discord. Uh, can someone go down the building and just check to see if they've lit up the, the office lights say SOS? Just, you know, what what is going on inside that building will, will, will be, 
a subject of much speculation the next week. Yeah, I, I think we can be safe to say that whatever the Watsi legal department or the Watsi high management think, I don't think the the grunts on the ground in the Watsi offices are on board for any of this. So when we say Watsi are the worst people ever, we were talking about the top management. Uh, the poor schmucks taking bullets in the in the offices. Uh, they they I think they they they're on our side, and that's that's a good. That's something we should belabor here. There's an awful lot of stuff flying around. There are people, who, lots and lots of people working work in Watsi who are there far longer than the current management team, which, like, Cynthia Williams came on a year ago. Uh, and with the shuffling that went on uh, with the death of the former CEO, like, there's a lot of fresh faces in the C-suite, the executive suite there. But the people in Watsi, some of them who have leaked, who we can't verify, said that the first they heard about any of this uh, the first re- the first communication they had from their management about this was on the 11th or 12th of January and it wasn't a lot and it was basically you know pull your neck in keep your mouth shut uh, so these and these people are being harassed I think it's fair to say that some of these people are being harassed online and they shouldn't be uh, and if you you know if you're writing an angry tweet or uh, putting powder in an envelope right now, Please, please, stop. Don't do it. Like these, <laughs> what's he's not full of evil people. It is a company made up of a lot of different people, the vast majority of whom could be working somewhere else for more money, but they want to work on D&D because they love it as much as you do. So do not they're, give they're them a hard time. They're not making the decisions that you don't like. Yeah, absolutely. Do not give them a hard time over this. They are going to need our support. Quite a few of them may lose their jobs because... You know, this could downsize the company to the point where they start cutting staff. Okay, um, uh, that's a very serious the, thing that yeah. we should keep in mind. They're real people, real feelings, real families, uh, and they don't need any... Like they're getting rained on from above inside the company. They don't need it coming from the grassroots as well. Uh, okay, so they, they continue in this sort of... in this kind of pandering, condescending, uh, apology, not apology line for the rest of this update which we think may have been edited a few times in the last 24 hours. Uh, they call out... So lastly, what they will not contain is any royalty structure. Again, this is speaking to a document they never ratified or confirmed was true or real uh, or accurate, but they're saying now that there won't be royalty structures in this new OGL. <laughs> I don't imagine those royalty structures won't exist. They're just not putting it uh, for the time hmm. being somewhere where you can see it because it is so onerous, and I'm going to talk about that later. Uh, okay, someone take the reins from me now. Where do we go next? Um, this? Well, there's another piece of context, I think, that needs to be added to that announcement via D&D Beyond. And I think it's telling that's where it ended up. Um, because um, part of the open, as part of the open D&D, well, protest is, yeah, protest isn't too strong a word. Um, there was quite. A, there was a call to unsubscribe, to cancel oh, some yeah. subscriptions to D and D Beyond. Good point. Yes. And I sus- And it's not a huge stretch to think that this is the. This is where Hasbro actually pay attention. As in, we're losing money. We're losing money rapidly. Or losing income. You know, as in, handy passive income for. Bear in mind a service that you could spend two dollars a pop on gaining access to a feat, like a singular feat. You could buy digital dice. They have, da- you know, they've visibly damaged their cash cow. Yeah, the D and D Beyond. There's lots of different ways to spend money there. Um, you can buy copies of books. You can buy. You can gift now. Books are a great idea. You can gift books to friends. And I say books. I say access to the. To the contents, to the um, the information, because it's it's on a website. It's not a book. Uh, you can spend, you can piecemeal spend to to purchase a character class or a particular block of monsters or whatever, what have you. But on top of all of that, there's a subscription service, a monthly ongoing, that you can spend as a player or a DM to uh, to use an enhanced version of the D and D Beyond encounter builder, character manager, campaign manager, etc. Lots and lots of people. After a call from, was it Jeannie G was the creator? She's a, a popular YouTuber. Did I get the right Jeannie G or Jeannie D or something? Okay. She, I think, was the first one that raised the idea of, hey, why don't we just go and subscribe? 
Now, if you unsubscribe, you don't lose access to any books and things you've purchased. You lose access to functionality. But as Dave, as you're pointing out, it's a very immediate hit to the bottom line because it's a monthly recurring. So as soon as they start seeing cancellations and there will not be renewals in February, yeah, that's a very easy way to to take the, the temperature of your community. Um, and I, I've talked to several people now who have unsubscribed, who were, are heavy users of, uh, of D&D Beyond. I would suspect that some of them have now lost access to certain characters because it, you know if, you, if you're on a free uh, plan, then you've only got a certain sort of number of slots for characters, campaigns, etc. Uh, but yeah, they felt strongly enough about it that they were like, I'm just not giving them money on, on the ongoing. Let's see Let's see what they're doing in March. I might go back to them. Uh, so yeah, it's a as you're saying, it's a huge, um, it's a huge flare to to send up to D and D management to say, hey, uh, 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 not today, not on my watch, not on my dime. Right. So yeah, very important context, and it's an ongoing thing. We don't know. We've no way of knowing how many people have unsubscribed. We've no way of knowing how much it's cost the company. But you can be absolutely sure if you hit unsubscribe, they're not getting your money and you're not alone. That's that's a big kind of, it's not necessarily a boycott, but it's a big move that apparently enough uh, customers are using as a means of signaling their displeasure. Hmm. And of course, you know, you, a lot of people will start talking about like the silent masses who have no idea about any of this drama, drama and will keep, um, you know, purchasing regardless but like the online community is where you get your power users and the people who will make subscribe to stuff like D&D Beyond so uh, you know they are they are they're losing power users and are ho- I guess the people who would be early adopters to whatever VTT they actually do come out with which again we still have no uh, you know full uh, breakdown of but yeah, so like, even if these are, you say, oh, this is just a couple, this is like 10,000 people unsubscribing, it's a drop in the bucket. Considering that the focus of this move is almost definitely to help secure D&D Beyond as their service, you know, losing the early adopters, like, if they are, and this is where we're starting to go into motivations, if they are trying to angle this whole thing so that they're less like a games company, more like a tech company, um, that even like the most high uh, in the clouds, disconnected uh, tech company CEOs know that losing the faith of your early adopters can be death for a new service. And, oh uh, yeah, that's that's what is at risk here, and that's <laughs> that, why they that unsubscribe. Reminds... Yes, uh, and to to speak directly to that, um, Cynthia Williams oversaw the launch and closure of Mixer, which was Microsoft's attempt to replicate Twitch. So she probably knows a thing or two about uh, failure to launch and losing the faith of your, your users. Mixer had a pretty... I mean, it spent a lot of money, pulled away big talent, and then had a fairly ignominious end. It could, uh, is Mixer still going? I don't know. It's like... I, I often sort of catch three in the morning. Someone will say, some voice in the back of my head will go, is uh, is is GeoCity still a thing? You know, <laughs> Mixer Mixer might be there somewhere. Who knows? Uh, but yes, losing losing faith from early adopters, losing faith from vocal uh, advocates and power users isn't a great move for any tech company. And um, probably worth noting that yeah, Watsi are definitely pivoting towards being a tech company. They reportedly have on the books hired salaried about three hundred and fifty software developers now which obviously uh, that's a lot of people crunching code uh, so presumably the VTT will be something else like it'll be pretty incredible um, if and when it surfaces but it won't like lots of software companies have made great products that no one bought because for any number of reasons but uh, alienating your fan base is definitely not a good a good way to start yeah like it's 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 not like necessarily that like what we call the online power users are like the majority of D and D players, but they are the people that you want to make the transition first. Like mm. they're 
their their pipe dream seems to be to move like ninety percent of the people who right now are just playing D anD D around their t- coffee tables and sort of start moving them to using the VTT first. So on hopes it has like a use of the table mode on your tablet as well as a use over Zoom mode or whatever. So I would want to have both those functionalities, but like, but yeah, like the the product's one thing, the transition is another, and like if they really want to turn vast swaths of their silent majority into internet users, then they first off have to have internet users to funnel them in to the the, the process, and that's where this misstep is uh, is starting to hurt is potentially going to hurt them. And they and there are influencers who have very publicly been outraged by the, these developments and are actively naysaying. And I mean, there's a, there, there's also spe- there's also talk of you know there's going to be influencers and um, companies that are going to get bought off by Watsi, and that's absolutely I I almost put money that'll happen, but there is. I, I try, you know, at, at least a, 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 an incentive to oppose Watsi on this, uh, you know, as in it might end up being social pressure to, you know, to, you know, to uh, you know, a, oppose the, you know this OGL or social pressure to join in with it, depending on how things shake out. Um, I mean, do we want to go into? more speculation with motivation here because like Uh, there is like yeah let's let's at this point break with simply reporting and applying we can go i think we can put the tinfoil hats on now we've uh we've been fairly restrained you take those off i I, i've had to this week it's uh, too many signals um yeah, let's. Uh, is there anything anyone would like to specifically sort of drill down on, or highlight, or uh, speculate about about the whole octopus that is the last like, couple of weeks? Yeah, like I, I definitely do want to just like kick one idea in the head. Go, go. The the point the point of this uh, OGL one point one was not to quote unquote make money. Like the, the 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 plan was not oh to, oh well, well there's there's Kickstarter's making three million dollars we'll take twenty five percent of that 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 was that was not it um the point here was to just stop people from wanting to use the OGL at all the point was to 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 make it so onerous to actually use an OGL uh for anything other than the absolute basic of I made a free picture of a kobold his name is B- Buttons and he has plus two charisma please like me I, it, it's, it, 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 the, the point was not to make money off of the small press people who rely on the OGL that they don't make any money like the people of DMs will just barely make money uh, I don't think it was any better in the OGL space. Now, the point here was to just make the OGL and the open games just not happen so that everyone who wanted to make stuff in the new uh, 1D&D space, the 6th edition space, is that they had to go to Watsi, hat in hand, and make a deal. It had to be a proper contracted deal. It couldn't just be, we put this page of text in the back of our book, and then we charge onwards. They didn't want that anymore. They wanted to have everyone who wanted to make money off DD come to them. That was that was the point. Um, the 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 crap deal in the OGL is so that the we can uh, you can beg us for a better deal. Huh. Right. You know, it, it's it's basically about control. It's about controlling the DD brand and making sure. That if anyone wants to deal with DNA brand, they come to Watsi or Hasbro or whatever. Um, now there's some language in that 1.1 draft we saw about the the you know f- weird stuff to put in your in your legal document or whatever is like um, we should not be in the business of feeding our competitors. 
And that raises the question of who do they consider their competitors in this space? Are they talking about, oh, we should kill Pathfinder? Are they talking about, oh, we should kill the OSR? I don't think that's what it is. I think one of their big competitors um, is the VTT space. The, the stuff like Roll20. I think they wanted to basically be able to throttle any OGL content going to Fancy Grand's Roll20. Um, I don't remember what the new ones are called again. Something Albert. But you, yeah. It's one of that, Sly First likes, like Shay. Um, yeah, and just on that point, we, we commented earlier on the earnings for Hasbro and WotC uh, and obviously this language in the, the OGL 1.1 says, oh, you know, <laughs> we never intended for this to be a way uh, for us to feed our competitors. Uh, what did we say for what for Watsi? 1.3 billion in 2020? Uh, like, would you, so if we think the Paizo was, you know, if they, if, because people's minds would go to Paizo as competition. So anyone care to take a guess at what they earned in 2020? 10 million? You're very close. 12 million. Hmm. Compared to 1.3 billion. That's what. That's literally less than one percent. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it doesn't like, <laughs> uh, it doesn't really stack up as a, as a good argument. I think you're entirely right that this is sort of a a document where you got to look at what they're not saying and what they very explicitly say that none of this covers VTTs, uh, which is as you point out where they're probably going as a company and where they'd prefer to own all of the the space, not some of the space. Yeah, yeah. They, they want the like they they want ongoing subscriptions, like not um, oh, yeah. not yeah, one off books so much. Although they'll still publish books more than likely. It's, you know, it's the nice to have on the shelf. Dave, anything you want to dig down on? Um, the yeah, the like it does. <sighs> Like it comes across to me, uh, like just echoing what something Shane said about not so much about making money as dominate. Like I think it's more about dominating the space, which will create mo- make the money over time. But like eliminating competition is, well, it's always uh, you know a, on the mind of co- of companies. Um, although I do wonder if antitrust legislation might might be an interesting way to go for opposition to this OGL move uh, also I have I ha- most of the speculation I've seen online has to do with American um, intellectual property law and that sort of thing I haven't seen as much about e- e- how EU law is applicable because I am because um, even like I, I suspect there you know it, that might be one of the reasons why some people are saying oh d d beyond removed its unsubscribe button no like I see it there's you know you're you're you're, you're posting misinformation. Um, there are different um, set up. You know, there are different settings pages between if you're in an EU jurisdiction. Uh, as far from my understanding of it, um, like you can tick off uh, whether you want your personal information sold by by D and D Beyond because that's a thing. Um, so I, I'm curious to see what the EU take on this is going to be because if what if Hasbro is trying to create a monopoly in EU te- in EU digital space, well, hmm, I don't think they'll like that. Oh boy! Well, I mean, like Elon Musk found out last year, uh, the EU response to a lot of what people try to do under American uh, law is no, no, no. We we don't do that here. We we do, we don't do that at all over here. You're going to have to roll a little slower and less hard uh, before we'll let you do that. Um, that's specifically, that's employment law where you just kind of you don't have the sort of at will uh, hire and fire uh, sort of scenario that you do in the states. But uh, and with GDPR, <laughs> GDPR is a, a big another big uh, club with which companies can get hit, especially but especially when you're moving people's when you're moving customers data in and out of the EU which mm. presumably uh, I don't know what what's the setup is uh, but yeah if they're an American company they're very likely holding a lot of their their data and data processing uh, in the states and they probably have subsidiaries here in 
Europe and elsewhere to deal with local regulations. So yeah, if if they tried to push through something like this, it could create quite a patchwork for them globally. Because as you rightly point out, uh, US law is not global law, uh, and other jurisdictions do get a say in how companies run their game. Um, okay, for me, yeah, I think I'd, I'd mirror a lot of what you guys have said. It's I, I, I keep saying it, we're not legal people, but I don't have to be a legal person to understand what 25% off the top means for business. It means good luck, sunshine. You're not getting into this game. It's an incredible... I was folding socks the other morning just thinking about this. Uh, yes, I, f- I fold socks. Uh, don't ask. And it just The analogy I have is a noose for an elephant. Because the wording in the, the 1.1 that we saw is and the, and they're very they stress this quite often like look we're asking for 25% but it's only on everything you make after $750,000 which is a lot of money a lot of money a uh, small company may or may not get above that in terms of revenue in any given year and uh, of course you got the 30 day change at will clause so what you have here is a noose for an elephant and what's your kind of... They hold up this noose and go, hey, look, you know, how big is your neck? It's regular human size, but like 18-inch neck. Look look at this noose. It's massive. It's a noose for an elephant. Hmm. <laughs> but never mind the fact that we're holding the other end of the rope. Kindly put your head in the noose. That's um, a colourful way of putting it. <laughs> because it could be tightened at any time. So... They, as they point out, oh, maybe there's 20 people on the planet, 20 organizations that will uh, that will qualify for this. Okay. But, uh, you know, 30 days time, you can lo- lower that to half a million. Uh, um, a year after that, you can, bring, you can bring that ceiling as far down as you like until that noose is tightened around anybody who signed when they looked at it and went, I'm never going to get to three quarters of a million. I'll be fine. Uh, I mean, I'd prefer not to have to fill in paperwork and announce every, and report every project to, to Watsi and, and get their imprimatur and that they agree that I haven't produced anything hateful or derogatory or demeaning. Uh, uh, Definitions they, uh, that could change at a moment's notice. Yeah, depending on uh, depending on who's on Twitter doing what. Um, like, the, the overreach in that document is wild. But if I don't understand anything else in that document, I can do the math. And in publishing, as, as you pointed already, the margins are so tight that 25% before you've paid your employees, before you've paid yourself, before you've paid for the paper stock or the, the toilet paper in the bathroom, what's he come and take 25% for the, for, for the hell of it? That's, you don't have what? a business anymore. There's no yeah. way to grow. There's absolutely no what? way to grow to any sort of scale because they, ne- they, they don't want another piezo. They don't want anybody ever coming even close to taking 1% of what they consider theirs. It's, a, yeah, it's amazing. Like, there's, 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 there's a lot of expectation this is meant to sort of kill the... Well, kill the current Paizo, but also kill, uh, prevent any future Paizos from appearing. S- salt the earth. Yeah. yeah, a little bit. In fact, there's some point... I've actually seen a few people, uh, maybe even some uh, our fellow party members, suggest that part of the point of this might not just be to kill, you know, the uh, 5.5 that some other party member. It might actually be to kill Fifth Dead as soon as they kick the switch on one D and D. Yeah, yeah, I uh, could see it. Because as uh, as I pointed out, it's it's real hard to get to herd your customers into a walled garden if uh, if you didn't start there. But a lot easier to build an ark and flood the world. It, just kill off. The, you know, just take the ground they're standing on away so that they have to get on board because there's no alternatives uh, and that's I think that's a lot of what uh, the legal kind of language in that document is, is aiming to do is to remove um, you know you're not going to be able to you're not going to be able to not, not that you can't play five fifth ed but you wouldn't find any support for it and eventually you yeah. wouldn't find any third parties making stuff for it and eventually, you just it, go ah, right. Play one. No VT, if no VTD can legally use yeah. Watsy stuff anymore, yeah. you couldn't go then, elsewhere. Uh, then you know, yeah. 
everything has to go to them. Okay. And this is just like crazy because like like just last year when we saw that they announced the VHT, we were all like, well, this 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 could be good. Like if they were to you know create this new uh, ecostructure of having a VTT for everyone and try to bring in all of their you know silent majority into it. I don't. No one would complain. It'd be, you know, sure they'd have the market share, but we've like the industry has proven for fifty years now that they're pretty much okay with with uh, the owner of Dungeons and Dragons having ninety percent of the market share in the RPG space. It's never been that you know that we want to have a big percentage. We're happy. The, 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 the industry has been happy with the cast off of people who are just sort of bored with D&D and want to try other things it's the fact that they're trying to they're what's your turning around and saying we would like to grow our business exponentially and push out that 1% of people who, who remain and it's just like like who like the only way you could make this sound virtuous in the slightest is as if they were genuinely afraid of like Viacom or uh, like General Electric or some other massive American conglomerate deciding oh we're making Bungeons and Baggins with our new VTT that we came up with last Tuesday uh, and here's 4 billion in marketing uh, to sell it like it is it like they they feel like like if they don't crush the small tiny guys who are no threat to them, then they'll have somehow set some precedent where some other giant will come in and compete with them just through the spending of vast amounts of money. Which I mean, if American laws are the way they are, I could guess it's conceivable, but I don't think anyone has shown any interest in doing this market. Are they that? paranoid and stuff like oh oh we're going to make billions off this new one D VTT <gasps> but what if someone else wants those billions that we haven't made yet is is that the thinking that justifies all of this absolute nonsense there's a lot of there's a lot of different ideas floating around um just to address yeah, before before I go there Hida Hito Owen isn't on this episode because he had to deal with some real life stuff. I guarantee you, he's got ten more takes uh, and and different directions to go on uh, on everything that we've talked about today. Um, I'm gonna we're gonna figure out how to how to get his opinions on the air at some point. Because well, we're probably he's got some going to be ideas. doing another episode oh, or yeah. two or, or yeah. on this uh, because this isn't going like this isn't going away um, there's like anyone talk about oh we'd be sh- with Watsi or you know Watsi's won no they're like no nobody's won or finalized anything yet there isn't yeah, even we, an official OGL out yeah we'd, we'd hoped to have a lot more uh, maybe a concrete conclusion to this story at this point but uh, we decided we'd put this episode out because there's a lot has already happened. Now, Shane, as you were saying, like, who's bigger? Who could come along? A bigger boy could come along and take our money. Um, yeah, it's, it does appear that there's this kind of a, a shift. Obviously, look, what's have changed radically in the last couple of years? Hiring 350 software developers um, is a big move. So they are... A, the analogy I've seen is that they're doing a Facebook to meta in that they're looking to, to fundamentally pivot the nature of the company. Uh, and that would put them in competition in spaces where they haven't been before. And, yeah, potentially lots and lots of money to be made. Um, so, so they're moving from making iMacs to making iPhones is what we're, yeah, what we're hearing. Yeah, about. something like that. It's uh, And that would perhaps put their whiskers up to the potential threats in the future from actors that we haven't even considered. Um, because certainly there's probably a lot of money. I mean... If your nearest competitor is making 1% of what you make, then they're not really a competitor. You're a, a big fish who's ready to get into a bigger body of water. Uh, and you're Now, another reason for this, if we're trying to figure out why all this nonsense, uh, it has also been uh, suggested that this is a preparation to sell, for somebody to sell something. Because if you... 
it's very hard to sell something you don't own outright. Try it sometime. A couple of bridges, things like that. Uh, so Watsi may have looked at the OGL as a an impediment to selling D&D. Or Hasbro may have looked at it as an impediment to selling Watsi. Or Hasbro may have looked at it as an impediment to selling themselves. Or, there's almost any number of they's who could be selling something in this scenario. But a definite thorn, a definite sort of uh, wrinkle in that plan would be this open sharing content kind of framework that a potential purchaser would come along and go, eh, we would prefer to just have the whole thing to ourselves, thanks. Otherwise, we devalue, you know, we'll, we'll bring our offer down massively. I mean, if you, if you wanted to buy a house and were told, uh, Great house, lovely house. Uh, we've done it all up, but every Tuesday there's a band who record in the uh, in the attic, and uh, we can you just kind of honour that agreement? You might go, um, no, <laughs> I'll buy a house with no band in it. Thank you. Um, so like, it's yeah. I mean, there are people who might take that deal. I wouldn't bet that it's a lot. None of them are big corporations with serious money who have ambitions uh, so yeah there's there's potential oh, yeah. for this to be a pivot there's potential for this to be a move to sell there's, uh, we are in wild open speculation territory here until we see more or until more is confirmed um, yeah I don't know like we're we're way over our usual um, run time here so a lot to talk about lots still talk about lots still talk about is there uh, okay, we should probably draw a line at this point what can we say? Uh, there has definitely been a seismic shift in the industry in a week, uh, even with very little confirmed or known for sure. And that's not going... Like, no one's going to turn around next week and go, actually, we're, we're, we'll sign that contract or we're not going to go ahead with our own initiative. Or, um, or even, you know, even at the grassroots players and GMs, I don't think they're going to abandon their plans to try new games. Uh, it turns mm. out you can learn a new system if you really want to. Uh, so we are at we're at a flex point. There's there's no <laughs> nobody knows what the rest of this year brings in terms of the uh, the most popular role playing game on earth and everything else. So we uh, we'll have to wait and see. I think. Yeah, like like w- people had been talking you know big talk about oh it's going to be the next fourth edition before that but that this is when that 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 actually comes home and says uh, actually no we we may have seen uh, a bonehead move on the order of the 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 marketing and the feel feel for it regardless of what you think about the quality of fourth ed the reason the fourth ed scattering happened was because Watsi completely lost control of the narrative and the the goodwill of the previous edition and they just throw it away for various petty reasons um, and this that is definitely what's happened in this case the, the, the goodwill is gone people are openly questioned there is open revolt and I, I don't necessarily think we're going to get another I don't know uh, the ORC will topple uh, Sixth Ed and uh, bring in the new thing of uh, Super Pathfinder Plus. Um, but I do think we are going to see that same mass diversification of the uh, of the gaming space that we saw in two thousand eight, two thousand ten. You know, I, I we are we're definitely seeing a big thing, and the next couple of years are going to be. A hell of a thing to see in terms of how gaming is going to go. Uh, will it be good? Will it be good? No way to know. Future's not, not written, but it's definitely um, someone's just put a pen, pen to paper. And uh, it's going to be an interesting story. Dave, you got us into all of this. Why don't you take us out? Well, um, while, yeah, while the. Well, the matter of the open gaming license and the uh, you know, all that that entails it continues. Uh, this episode does not, uh, and this party is over. Uh, 
Thank you for listening to the Adventuring Party. If you'd like to leave us a voicemail, you can head on over to SpeakPipe and uh, drop us a line. Or you can join us on our Discord server, where we keep the party going after hours. Uh, Otherwise, you can find us on Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, or Twitter. Or or you can email the hosts at party at theadventuringparty.net. The Adventuring Party is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike Version 3 license. But you probably knew that already. We hope you enjoyed the episode, and look forward to seeing you back here next week. Goodbye.